Hey guys, it's Andy and uh, Wes here from D6 Evolution. Today we're going to be talking about the assault phase. Now, the assault phase is probably the most complex phase of, uh, of the game, but uh, we're going to run you through some cool tips and tricks and uh, show you how to really sort of catch your opponent off guard. Yeah, there are quite a few tricks that you can actually uh, apply with the assault phase. Um, some where you kill your enemy instantly, um, some where you gain some extra distance. Uh, so Andy's going to run you through several of those uh, today. Yeah. So I think the, before we get started, I think the important thing to bear in mind is what you want to achieve in the assault phase. Is it like Wes says, is it just to sort of shoot your units up the board, get extra distance? Is it to kill stuff? Is it to tie uh, units up in combat so they can't be shot? Or is it to sort of grab objectives? I'm going to show you how to do all these things um, and a few other sort of tricks. Right, let's get to it. Let's do it. Yeah. What we're going to be doing now is we're going to go over the basic rules of the assault phase. Now, what I'm doing this is that there's, there's so many different intricacies in the assault phase, and it's key that you understand the basic concepts, and then we're gonna go into some scenarios, and I'm gonna show you all the cool things you can do with, with the assault phase. Now, the first, the first thing to grasp, go over the basics, is that you can only declare a charge against something which is 12 inches away or less. For example, these Deathwing Knights here, they can declare a charge against the cultist, but the obliterators here are just out of range. Now, if a unit has the ability to move more than 12 inches in the assault phase, such as this Eversaw here, he can potentially move up to 18 inches because he charges 3d6. He can still only declare a charge against something which is 12 inches away or less. Now, for example, if the obliterators were up on here and he was much closer, now it may take him more than 12 inches to get to them, but because he's less than 12 inches away, he can declare a charge. Even though when he does charge, he may have to move more than 12 inches to get up the level of the ruin as well. Now, the second concept to grasp is when you roll your charge range, only one unit in the charging, only one model in the charging unit actually has to go within an inch of the unit here. So when these Deathwing Knights roll the charge range, now they get a huge charge, they get nine inches, which is more than enough for them to make it into base-to-base -base contact with the cultists, but they can do a lot more than that. For example, if they needed an objective four over here, some members of the unit could actually go over to objective four like so. Now they need to keep in uh, unit coherency, but the rest of the unit, nine inches will easily get this person into base-to-base -base contact here, and the rest of the unit can go like this. So these Deathwing Knights have engaged the cultists in combat, but they've also claimed an objective as well. Now if you had a really, really big unit, you could, you could claim an objective back here, and one over here, and engage the, the unit in the uh, in close combat as well. It's only when you pile in and consolidate do you have to move towards the closest unit. When you charge, you can move wherever you like. It's a free move. The only stipulation is one of your models has to be get within an inch of one of the targets that you chose for your, for your charge. Now with that in mind, you can declare multiple charges. So, if the Deathwing Knights were here um, and they weren't sure if they can make the longer charge across the obliterators, they would declare a charge both on the cultists and on the obliterators as well. So that if your charge falls short, you can still attack something. And if you get a really lucky charge, you can get into your juicy target, which is the obliterators over here. The next thing to, uh, to grasp, and I'm gonna use just one model here, is when you, pile in and consolidate, you only have to get a tiny bit closer towards the, uh, towards the, en the enemy model. So when this Deathwing Knight here, he can pile in three inches. Now the only stipulation is he has to end up slightly closer. So if he starts an inch away, he just has to end like a millimeter under an inch. So he's gonna pile in his three inches to here, and then when he consolidates at the end of combat, if he hasn't killed it, he can pile in another three inches. Now this would be fantastic if, for example, 
objective four was over here, you'd pile in your three inches and you'd consolidate your three inches and all of a sudden you're on an objective where you weren't before. The only way you can prevent someone from doing this is if in your com it, when you activate your unit, you put them into base-to-base -base contact. When they're in base-to-base -base contact, a, unit can no, a model can no longer get any closer by piling in, so it's not allowed to move. So the next thing to talk about is when you charge, you have to stay an inch away from anything that you didn't charge. For example, if these Deathwing Knights charged the obliterators but they didn't charge the cultists, they wouldn't be allowed to get within an inch of these cultists during the, during the, uh, the charge phase. So after the charge phase, so if they came round to here, so they'd have to stay an inch away, making a longer charge. After the, uh, after the charge phase, they'd be free to pile in to the closest model, even if they didn't charge it. The only problem is now, because they didn't declare them as a target for their, for their uh, assault, these models here, they can't actually attack the cultists. Okay, so, um, so tips and tricks for the charge phase. Now, as you can see here, we've got an Eversaur assassin who wants to assault and tie up these obliterators here. Now, what we've got here is a very effective screen done by the cultist. Now, this is an effective screen for the movement phase because this Eversaur can't go within an inch of the, uh, the cultist when they're moving. Now, in the assault phase, this Eversaur can go within an inch of these, providing he declares it as a target for his assault. So what we're going to do here is we're going to declare a target for both the, um, both the cultists and the obliterators, which are 12 inches away. So when this, um, when this Eversaur rolls his charge range, now he gets 3d6 charge. So he would get 5 plus 3 for 8 plus 9, 10, 11. So 11 inches plus the 1 extra inch you gain in this edition would make 12 inches. So he could move through this unit now because he can go, he can go within an inch of them and he can engage this obliterator in combat, thus tying them up for the turn. So that's absolutely fantastic. The next thing you can do, now obliterators are a really shooter unit as I'm sure you're aware. Now they, they can easily kill an Eversaur assassin in combat. So the next thing you could do is if you deep strike in this uh, Eversaur, you could put him out of line of sight of the obliterators when you charge. Now, being an infantry model, he can charge straight through Ruin's walls and uh, engage the obliterators. The obliterators can't overwatch him as they can't see him. It's quite hard to pull off, but with more and more line of sight blocking terrain becoming available in tournaments, it, it, it's situational, but when it does come up, it's great. Um, the other thing to think about is if you're charging these obliterators, with your Eversaur Assassin. Again, you don't want them to be overwatched. The other thing you could do is if you had um, a cheap sort of throwaway unit nearby, like a Rhino, which is really, really tough, and the Obliterators are unlikely to kill that in combat, even with a couple of lucky shots. If you charge your Rhino in first, you've tied them up in combat, and then you're free to charge in your more fragile units, like your Eversaur Assassin. Okay, now, the, uh, the, last, the last trick is probably the most relevant and the one which comes up the, uh, the most is heroic intervention. Now, the key thing with heroic intervention is that you can heroically intervene, you can move three inches um, and engage a unit in combat if it's within three inches of, of a character at the start of your opponent, sorry, at the end of your opponent's charge phase. So this Eversaur Assassin's a character. These cultists have strayed a bit too close to them. Now the key thing here is that these cultists didn't have to actually charge this turn. They could have just moved here. So because they've moved in three inches, my Eversaur Assassin 
can immediately engage them. Now, the best thing to do with this is that objectives, in order to get an objective, you must be three inches from the center of an objective to be able to claim it. Now, if you put a character on top of an objective, an opponent can never try and steal an objective from you without, becoming within th without coming within three inches of it. So in order to get this objective, they must always, they'll always have to fight the Ebersaur Assassin. So it's fantastic if you've got a strong character, it's the end of game, and you know your opponent's gonna try and tow into an objective with a unit of scouts or cultists, and the chances are if you've got a strong character on there, you're gonna kill them. Right, the next thing I wanna show you is how the assault phase, just think of it as an extra movement phase, the amount of movement you can get is, is absolutely phenomenal. So the first thing to note is sometimes uh, your, your opponent has sort of chaff units like there's a couple of cultists here, there's a one remaining Nurgling here. Now, instead of killing these units in the shooting phase, you can use them to reposition your models and gain extra movement. So Samael here has moved up into range of these obliterators over here, which are just under 24 inches away now. Maybe a little bit less, just for the sort of purposes of the video. What he's gonna do here is he's moved into range, he can shoot these obliterators here, and what he's gonna do in the charge phase is he's gonna assault these two cultists, and in doing so, when he rolls his charge range, even with four inches, he can move back all the way round to here, and when he piles in and consolidates, he can move all the way back round to here, and that's got him well out of range of the obliterators. It's a really, really good tip there. So just leaving two cultists alive, which are gonna die in the assault phase anyway, you've moved into range, and then you've backed out of range. I mean, if that's not some Eldar trickery, I don't know what is. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, you could use it to move out of cover and then assault this, this unit here, and then you can, uh, you can suddenly move back into cover again, uh, or out of line of sight of the unit. Obviously, it depends on where your opponent's sort of placed his models, which brings me on to the next point. Don't ever allow your opponent to sort of slingshot off your models into your key sort of units in your army. For example, this Nurgling has been placed very, very poorly by this Chaos player. It's going to allow these Deathwing Knights here to assault this Nurgling, slingshot off him and get, potentially even tie up these, uh, tie up these uh, obliterators. But the key thing to remember with these side of bases, if an if a opponent's placed a unit six inches or less behind it, you can easily tie that one up in combat. So, we've got eight inches away, so we need a seven inch charge on this obliterator here. Oh, we rolled poorly, but that's why we have command rerolls. Let's say we rolled a nine. So we move forwards to here. I'll just show you with one model. In our piling, we'd keep an inch, just under an inch away, and we'd move all the way around to here. Now with a whole unit of Deathwing Knights, we'd kill this Nurgling, so he'd be removed. Now, we'd get an extra three inches of movement here, and then we could tie up these obliterators. So to show you that again, they're six inches away. You'd move round here, so you've got an inch gap here. The base is just over an inch. Then you can move three inches forwards, and you have to just be an inch or less away from the obliterator. So you can move six, so you can tie up something which is six inches away from your original target. And even if you don't get to uh, tie up the target, say they're much, much further away, you're going to put a lot of pressure on your opponent. So these Deathwing Knights, hopefully I roll better than last time. Terminators, let's see, always ones with your Terminators. So, if I roll the dice, oh, five inch charge, fantastic. So, I'd put my five inches forwards to here. So if I rolled higher, say if I rolled like a nine, I could move them even further forwards up to here, and then I could just put them further back like so, because only one has to stay within an inch. Now when I kill this unit, I can then consolidate forward three inches. Now, it gets even better as if you've got multiple units assaulting. 
So if Samael killed this obliterator, this, uh, this Nurgling, before they'd had a chance to activate, now, there's no units within an inch of this, these Deathwing Knights who charged, but because they charged this phase, they can both pile in and consolidate because they charged this phase. Only units which didn't charge this phase have to be within an inch. So in this case, they get even more movement because they can pile in their three inches and they can consolidate their three inches. Now, although they haven't managed to get quite within a, uh, quite within an inch of those obliterators, they've put a huge amount of pressure on that Chaos player because obliterators can only move four inches. So they're gonna have to kill these Deathwing Knights next turn or they're definitely gonna be assaulted and killed in combat. So the next thing to talk about is how you can use your pilot and consolidate to engage multiple units in combat. For example, I'll have to change the units around a little bit here. If you've got two tanks in a Dark Angels gun line here, and you've got one lone pesky uh, berserker left, what he's going to do is he's gonna charge the Rhino, but not the uh, Sakaran. So he's gonna charge with his range, See, they roll much better than uh, Terminators. So he can move nine inches in. So he's gonna move all the way across to here. And when he piles in, and when he consolidates, providing he's still getting slightly closer, he can move in and tie these both up in combat so neither can fire next turn and they're gonna to have to fall back. What you tend to see is you tend to see opponents grouping things like tanks together so that they can get the buffs and re-rolls from sort of Space Marine uh, sort of captains and so forth. So they're, they're easy pickings for a little move like this where you, you pile in and you consolidate and then you tie everything up in combat. So the key points here is just think about um, all the extra movement that you can get in the assault phase. But also remember your opponent's going to do the same thing as well. So don't, don't position your sort of chaff units um, in a position where he can suddenly slingshot into the rest of your army. Because these Deathwing Knights, although they're never going to reach the Obliterators, if they roll well, oh, which they did for once, they got 11 inches there. So they can move all the way over to here. And what they're going to do is just tail back to this, uh, this Nurgling here. They'll easily kill the Nurgling because four are within range, and then they can pile in further. So even if they can't reach those obliterators up there, you've just given them, you've just given them a, a huge, huge movement boost. You've given them 11 inch charge, plus you've given them a three inch pile in and consolidate move. So you've given them a huge, you've given them 17 inches of extra movement by carelessly positioning one Nurgling. Whereas if you'd put your Nurgling over here or completely out of range, then they'll be stuck back over here and you get an extra turn of shooting against them. So it's really, really important to remember not to let your opponent slingshot off your models. Right guys, and the next thing I'm gonna show you how extra movement in, uh, in the, uh, the assault phase can be absolutely key to winning the game. Um, and so as we've discussed before, you can use uh, extra movement to, um, to grab objectives. Um, you can use it to tie units up. Um, the other thing you can do is you can stop your own units being shot. So if these Deathwing Knights, if they want to assault, um, they, they may want to assault both the Cultists and the Nurglings here. Now these Deathwing Knights, they could easily kill both units. Though that's not very ben beneficial because next turn these Obliterators are gonna kill the Deathwing Knights. So the best thing to do here is only declare the Cultists as the, uh, as the intended target. And what we're gonna to aim to do is kill the cultists, but tie up this unit of Nurglings. So when I roll my charge range, seven inches, that's enough to get me where I need to get. So all I'm gonna do is put one unit here within an inch, and the rest of the unit is gonna move somewhere completely different. Because we know we can kill this unit of cultists here. So, um, what we have to stay more than an inch away from this unit in the charge phase because we didn't declare it as a target. Whereas we have to get within an inch of that unit there. 
So when we now pile in, we can pile in our three inches to here, to here, here, and here. And we'll pile in here as well. So these two units, these two models can fight and they'll easily kill these coulters here. Now when we pile in, we're gonna make sure that we cover at least three models form a sort of triangle around it to prevent this nurgling from escaping. And we have to keep a unit coherency as well. So we can't actually fight against this nurgling because we didn't declare it as a target. Now, next turn, this nurgling can't move out of combat because it can't move through the terminators because it can't physically fit there. So the obliterators, they can't actually shoot the Deathwing Knights. Yeah, another great thing to sort of remember is that if you've got two units um, which, which uh, charge in and kill something, such as this Berserker here, although he did a great job against the Rhino, he's now dead. So if Samael killed him, this unit here has no longer got anything within, within an inch of it. But because it charged this phase, it can both pile in and consolidate towards the closest unit even though there's nothing within an inch of it. So he can still get a six inch movement. Now Berserkers, they can even fight twice. So he could get a 12 inch, he can get, yeah, get 12 inches. Even if there's nothing around him, he can get 12 inches because he can both pile in and consolidate twice because that's his rule. So he can fight twice in every phase. Right, so we've had a little rearrange round here. And the next thing I want to show you is how you can control the pilings of your opponent to make sure that their key assault unit can't assault what you want them to. For example, Samael here is going to charge these Berserkers, which is a tall order because Berserkers are really nasty in combat. What he doesn't want is this Power Fist over here coming in and ruining his day. So I've, I've uh, placed my flyer here, the Dark Talon, just over an inch away. So when Samael charges in, he doesn't need a big charge. He's gonna charge over here. Now, assuming Samael completely whiffed, which is unlikely, but can happen, the Berserkers have to pile in towards the closest enemy model. So these guys can pile in this way, this guy's slightly closer, so he can pile in this way. Now these units up here, they can't move towards Samael, because they have to go towards the closest model, which is this flyer. Even though the flyer is not in combat, it's still the closest model. So this power fist here can't move in and therefore can't engage Samuel in combat. Either can these models here. So in actual fact, instead of the whole unit of Berserkers being able to fight, the only ones who can actually fight are these three models. Well, not even that. So you'd probably have these, these two or maybe these three models, depending on exactly how they, uh, they piled in, um, which is a huge difference for Samuel being able to survive this combat. The next thing I want to show you is that if your opponent positions poorly, you can, uh, you can, again, stop them being able to use their unit effectively in combat. So if this unit of Berserkers was at maximum coherency, like so, and you charged in a unit at either end, so you charged in your Eversaur Assassin here, and you charged in Samael here. Now, in order for him to actually engage you in combat, he'd have to pile in. Now, he can't physically pile in this way and this way because he'd break unit, unit coherency. Um, and as the rules say, any time a, a unit moves, it must, it must end its move in coherency. Because if this one tried to move this way, it'd break coherency here and so forth. Because these models here have to pile in towards somewhere else, and these ones have to pile in towards um, the Eversaur Assassin. So what you end up happening is actually only one model can fight here and only one model can fight over here. So you're effectively, you can hold a unit in combat. And maybe this isn't the best example because these two units are actually very good in combat, but you can, you can use it where very, very poor units like cultists, uh, two units of very small units of cultists could easily tie up. Maybe a berserker or maybe the nerglings could. Uh, you can tie them up in combat. Um, so you can actually hold a very, very strong assault unit in combat because the middle part of the unit can't fight at all. Uh, and the last thing I just wanted to show you, which I think is, a <laughs> you may surprise some people, is when you're fighting in the assault phase, you could actually, if you're on 20, 28 mil bases like these cultists here, 
you could actually fit four ranks can actually fight because the, a 28 mil base is slightly less than an inch. So these cultists here, I'm going to need more cultists, I think. Assume those really large ranks here. So, like so. So four whole ranks can actually be within an inch of a model width which is an inch. The front rank's within an inch, obviously. The second rank is also within an inch because the first rank's base is less than an inch. And the third and fourth ranks are within a model within an inch of a model that is within an inch. So this is really, really good tactic for things like orcs who uh, have a huge, huge, huge um, amount of bodies and they want to try and get in as many into combat as possible. So if they're on 28 mil bases, you can actually fit four whole ranks in against, uh, against the enemy unit, which is a huge amount of attacks if you're playing orcs. Right guys, that, that is literally everything I can think of a sort of uh, in the assault phase. Um, what about you, Wes? Have you got anything else to add? Yeah, so I think you just missed one thing out, which is the um, the wrap of the. Uh, oh, that dirty trick! <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so what you can do is when you're uh, assaulting a vehicle, uh, if you position your, your oh, troops really? such, if you move that, would be great. Yeah. If you position your troops such that you wrap around that they can't actually then disembark and keep an inch away from you, then they'll automatically die no matter what they are. Yeah, that's a really dirty trick. Thing to remember is, guys, that they can, they can uh, get out the vehicle up to three inches away, so you've got to make sure the, uh, the back end of the base is more than two inches away from the transport. Otherwise, all they can do is they can quickly jump out on the other side of your base, of the other side of the, uh, your models. See, so providing you sort of measure the, providing you measure it properly, you can kill everything inside of transport. It's a good one to know. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you don't manage to do it, at least you can stop them uh, getting out of the transport. Yep, yeah, that's also pretty good. Yeah. So how about you, what's your favourite one? Oh, I still love that heroic intervention. It is, the, uh, it is the funniest trick if people aren't expecting it. You get a character within three inches of uh, enemy models in their phase. They can pile in and they can attack. Um, they don't need to have charged this turn. So it's fantastic for sort of guarding objectives, particularly at the end of the game when those scouts or uh, other units are trying to tow in on, uh, on your objective. Yeah, you pull that one on me, I'll get to my answer room. <laughs> <laughs> the, the red mist descended from over that point then. No, it's was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I'll remember that one. You, you only fell for it once. <laughs> yeah. no, maybe twice, no, actually. No, never again, no. never again. <laughs> right, so... Um, let us know what you want to cover next. Um, just uh, type in the comments below. Um, but we're going to be doing the we're going to be doing some tips and tricks on the movement phase and the uh, the assault phase. No, not the assault phase. Shooting phase next week. Just yeah. the assault phase. Yeah. <laughs> Good. It's all about the assault. Right. Take care, guys. We'll see you next time.